when COVID first hit, nobody honestly knew what was going to happen. So the lenders that were basically backed by Wall Street and big bank money, the money just disappeared. So I would have frantic phone calls, you know, hey, can you save this deal, you know, by next Tuesday, you know, being the Thursday beforehand, it's like, you know, I need 14 days to underwrite and you're trying to get me to close in four. Um, you know, it's just not going to happen. So I watched a lot of earnest mo deposit money. I watched a, a lot of just general money just disappear, you know, in the first six months of what happened during COVID. Um, and then we really got to see who is controlling the money. This is your daily real estate syndication show. I'm your host, Sam Rust. With me today is Kevin DeRico. Kevin is the founder and fund manager of Birch & Dobson, a private real estate debt fund located in Connecticut. Um, in addition to being a fund manager, Mr. DeRico is also main, uh, retained by a hedge fund as a monthly consultant to the private lending industry. Birch & Dobson is a private real estate debt fund that focuses on lending against multifamily assets in a variety of different forms that I'm sure we'll dive into. Kevin, welcome to the show. Thanks for joining us today. Thanks for having me, Sam. Appreciate it. So, Kevin, as I was diving in, getting to know you and your firm a little bit, you guys have been in the industry a while. Birch & Dobson was founded back in 2007. So you, you've uh, achieved the famed lived through a cycle and, and one of the worst ones we've seen at that. Uh, I'm curious, the origin story behind the name Birch & Dobson. Could you maybe share that with us as well as how you got into commercial lending? Yeah, absolutely. And, and generally, that is the first question people ask because they say, who's Birch and who's Dobson? But it, it's really a much simpler conversation of that, it's the two streets I grew up on. Huh. I have uh, the idea is you don't know where you're going until you know where you've been. And keeping that, uh, you know, grounds me, makes me understand, you know, don't stop because you end up going back to where you were. Hey guys, it's Whitney. I wanted to take some time to introduce you to my good friends over at PassiveInvesting.com. They're a national private equity real estate firm based out of the Carolinas. They focus on acquiring institutional quality apartments and self-storage facilities. They do this with private accredited investor funds. They have a portfolio of over $700 million in assets and control over $250 million in equity from their investors. PassiveInvesting.com makes it easy for you to start investing in real estate without all the hassles. They even have an average 62% repeat investor rate in each offering they put together. They even have a real estate debt fund that offers hard money loans to local fix and flippers across the U.S., which currently has a 0% default rate. To help you learn more, they've put together a free passive investor guide that outlines the seven red flags for passive apartment and self-storage investing. Visit PassiveInvesting.com forward slash red flags to download the PDF now. That's PassiveInvesting.com forward slash red flags. Yeah, it, it is interesting um, you know, I'm 30, so you, you're still fairly fresh in this industry, um, but move, have moved away from home. And, uh, and yet often my thinking, my inclinations, they do return to where you come from. Um, yeah. there's a, a, it's not, uh, not a, just axiomatic that we're always asking, where are you from? Where you're from tells a lot about you as a person. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I always, you know, I grew up in a real estate family. So my father owned at one point a street. So to me, I didn't know anything different. You know, when I would go to back to school, when I was in elementary school, people say, oh, what'd you do this weekend? It's like, oh, I went, you know, mowed the lawn on seven houses. And, you know, they don't really, to me, it was normal. And everybody else are like, you're out of your mind. So, you know, when I had the idea of coming up with the name, it was just like, well, what, what really built me? You know, what really gave me the ideas, what gave me the mentality, what did my dad teach me? Um, and a lot of that has stuck with me up until now and still, you know, will in the future because, you know, learning is something that we're never going to stop doing. And no matter what I'm going through, I can just look back. The name is on the card. The name is on the, the masthead. And I understand, you know, what I have to do. So there's so many different ways to get into real estate. Um, and you chose the the private debt origination side. Why get into why to get into commercial real estate on that end of the spectrum? Well, it, to me, I'm I'm a little bit of a weirdo. Like 
you know, when we'd be listening to the radio or, you know, watching TV, I'd see an advertisement for a bank or a car loan. And I would always ask, like, why does the bank give you a loan on a car or how does it work? Or, you know, how can they afford to give you a loan at three and a half percent? And I would ask those questions. And uh, those questions would be answered. You know, my dad would tell me, oh, this is why they do it. And it just always sparked an interest in banking which would be a weird thing for a young guy to, to be interested in. Um, but it never left me. And then when I first started Burch and Dobson, it was a debt purchasing company. So um, my grandfather was a sheriff and he would buy debt and he would, you know, rehab it, get people paying again. Um, you know, and he would give out mortgages. So it, it just sparked my interest from a young age. And then when you try to get into this business at a high level, it's nearly impossible. Like everybody can be a broker, you know, to be a, a really good businessman at, at this type of thing, you have to have kind of insider information just as to, in, you know, syndication, you have to start somewhere and to really understand it, you have to align yourself with other people to really understand how to underwrite things, how to get things on the books, you know, who to talk to, how to build and simulate a team. Um, just going through all that basically gave me what I needed to do to get into this business. There's no real rhyme or reason how I ended up here. It's just a accumulation of experiences, past people in my life. And this is just how I ended up here. So you fund a wide variety of stuff. I was looking at your website and you know, it could be you know, single family homes to fourplexes as a product. You're funding flips in that range. Um, you're also helping fund syndicators. Um, with some bridge type products um, and maybe even some longer term transactions as well. I am guessing that in your 14 plus years in the industry, you've seen a pitch deck or two um, yes. from folks on our side of the table. Uh, and I'm curious if there's a common thread of those operators you find yourself working with again and again versus those who maybe fly by night and don't have the same level of success. Is there some commonality that you can pick out um, from how they approach the lending process that maybe would inform um, how some members of our audience could approach the lending process. Absolutely. And in any industry, the, the best package deal gets the most eyeballs. So to make your life a lot easier, do the same thing with your emails, do the same thing with your pitch decks. The simplest things is including the zip code in the deal that you're sending to me uh, or any lender or syndicator actually really makes a big difference because then I don't have to spend 15, 20 minutes trying to go through and figure out which co which county, which zip code that the deal is. So something as simple as that can really change the outlook on how your deal is presented to somebody. You can go as simple as just Googling pitch decks, pull up a random pitch deck. doesn't even have to be in the same industry. Just see how a professional company puts a pitch deck together and just mimic it, mirror it and send it out. And I can guarantee you, you'll get a much better response, whether it's through, you know, your LPs, your brokers, your lender, put a nice bow on it and send it out. And you'll be absolutely amazed at the response that you get as somebody that professionally puts a deal, to, deal package out. Yeah. It's something that I would encourage folks to do both on the debt side and when you're going and soliciting for equity as well. Take the time to build your pitch deck correctly. I've seen firsthand a lot of different styles of pitch decks and, and there's no one right answer, but they're also, it's very hard to shortcut it. Um, if you don't put the time in, if you don't bring the resources to the table that are appropriate, you're going to have something that's subpar. Um, and we've seen several deals, even recently in this environment where capital is just looking for a home. We've seen several deals that had significant problems coming together. And a lot of that was because people assumed the money would be easy to get to and didn't take the time to put it together well. Um, it, it almost speaks more to the quality of the operator in general than it does the deal if you're willing to take that extra time, proofread your text, Make sure that uh, the answers that either your lender or your investor are looking for are contained in that package. Absolutely. The little things really do matter in this business, uh, you know, and, and much like any other business. Uh, and we understand the time that you put in to put a pitch deck together. So if somebody puts the time into putting the pitch deck together that I can understand and, you know, articulate and figure out what's going on within five, 10 minutes that's the deal that I'm going to look at. The other ones are basically going to have to go on the back burner or if they're bad enough, they're going in the trash. So 
save yourself the aggravation, put a little extra time in it up front, and life will be much easier for everybody. No, no. So we've talked a little bit about lending packets and, and all of that, Kevin. I'm also curious um, just how the industry has changed um, over the last couple of years. You know, we've I, back in 2018, I remember being in a lot of different real estate meetups and people wondering what inning we were in um, as far as the market cycle. And everybody was waiting for the hammer to drop or the bottom to fall out, whatever it, your, your favorite term is. And then COVID hits and we all run for the hills for a little bit um, and huge unknown. Uh, that ends up not being maybe as bad a headwind as we had anticipated for the industry. Um, I'm curious from your side on the, the lending side, what, how did that process unfold during COVID? What are some of the, the maybe what ifs that we missed um, that are positive and or negative? And, and where do things sit today in your opinion? Well, when COVID first hit, nobody honestly knew it was going to happen. So the lenders that were basically backed by Wall Street and big bank money, the money just disappeared. So I would have frantic phone calls, you know, hey, can you save this deal, you know, by next Tuesday, you know, being the Thursday beforehand, it's like, you know, I need 14 days to underwrite and you're trying to get me to close in four. Um, You know, it's just not going to happen. So I watched a lot of earnest deposit money. I watched a, a lot of just general money just disappear, you know, in the first six months of what happened during COVID. Um, and then we really got to see who is controlling the money. When you have a private lender, you really figure out whether or not they're private and whether or not their funds are backed by bonds or, you know, big banks. And that really opened up my eyes, especially now as to who can really fund the deals. And it kind of changed my marketing a little bit, um, the, to be able to target syndicators, you know, in this particular business, really gives you an idea of how much money there is out there in the private space. So as bad as COVID was, it gave us in the lending industry like, okay, the real players are A, B, and C. Um, Not throwing my name into that mix. I'm still a small fish in a very large pond, but it gave me the idea of who I was really competing with. And, you know, we just watched what Zillow tried to do with buying up single family homes. It didn't work. And I think when we got through most of COVID, a lot of that institutional capital realized that this isn't just the greener side of the fence and that you need to be here or you're not going to get the phone calls. So I think in general, we might've came out better, you know, on my end, on the private debt side, because the big banks got scared. Will they come back? Because they kind of saw how really the industry didn't get shaken up as much as they would. They could, but I think they're still a little shy and scared about it. In my estimation, that seems like a healthy thing. Um, Whenever you have an industry get centralized, you always worry what's the systemic risks are being introduced into the market. And you can see that in the the Great Recession of 2008 with the the mortgage-backed securities and how that introduced a variable that nobody really could see at the time. And yet, in retrospect, seems so obvious. Do you think that maybe we dodged a bullet by not going through a wave of consolidation on the debt side during COVID and you didn't have a Blackstone or a Morgan Stanley or somebody like that get a wild hair and go accumulate hundreds of these smaller shops? Absolutely. And, and it didn't just wouldn't have stopped in the debt portion. We were probably two or three months away from you know them realizing that the COVID would not hit this industry as hard as, as they thought it was going to. And we just needed one multi-billion dollar hedge fund to just start walking down Main Street and buying up apartment buildings. Uh, we would have been having a very different conversation, you know, had they would have come to that realization sooner. And, you know, what would have happened? And it's not just our industry. It's like, what would have happened with the renters? You know, if Blackstone comes through and they just did this, I think it was Blackstone or, or one of the large hedge funds, they walked through Pennsylvania and bought up hundreds of single family homes at one time. And if you look at that area and you do a price comparison for rentals, they've raised the prices up to 30%. That's not what we serve. That's not the industry that it should be. Um, You know, our job is to give people homes, you know, in the syndication space. My job is to lend money for 
syndicators like you to provide good homes for people. So, and at a, at a rate that they can afford, um, we're seeing it now with the single family homes being completely ran up in prices. Who's to say that wouldn't have happened with single with multifamily as well. Yeah. Um, well, and in many ways, I, I think multifamily just moves a little bit slower because it's not quite as transactional. Um, and even there, in some of the local markets that we transacted, December was a record month, both for number of transactions, for total volume, dollar volume. Um, we're seeing pricing records fall. Um, it seems like that wave is only continuing to build in the multifamily mm. space, um, just like we've seen in the headlines for single family. Right, right. And of course, you know, everybody's in the business to provide value and the more value you get, the more rent you should be able to charge. And of course, that's the idea, um, you know, one that we all have to work by, but to have somebody or a big entity come in and just be a number and raise those prices without providing the value to give, you know, renters a better lifestyle, life standard for that money is a, is a big, you know, could have been a very big concern. You know, when you get, when you have to pay for nothing, just because, because you have to play, you know, placate the shareholders and get your stock price up. It's a different conversation. Yep. You mentioned that during COVID, as it started unfolding, you realized who you were competing against and that changed your marketing. How could you go uh, elaborate on that a little bit more, go into a little bit more detail on, on what you've, found out what you discovered and how that's impacted your business over the last year or so? Yeah, uh, we were able to get more focused into social. Um, it made more sense for us to, to spend more time talking to people, whether it be through, you know, a smaller channel like Bigger Pockets or, you know, or, you know, Facebook groups, just getting the word out there. You're like, hey, this is what we can do. These are the references I can provide for you. Um, you know, the advertising is not going to work for us mainstream because the market is so niche. And we were able to see what was working for the people that were staying around and what completely fell off when the ones that got scared ran away. It is interesting um, watching those groups that either did pivot or those that just hunkered down. Um, and I think it's a reminder for all of us that conditions are always changing. We should always be evaluating what's going on and then making decisions and taking action based on those decisions. There's a lot of people that decided not to deploy capital in 2020, as an example. And mm -hmm. you know, LifeBridge Capital, we deployed quite a bit in 2020. And we've actually already exited one of those deals um, to fantastic returns because we developed an investment thesis. We went out and executed. Now, you're not always going to be able to time it just right. But if you don't take action, nothing's going to happen. So I, I think you're proof of that. LifeBridge is proof of that. And I would just encourage folks that as we hit 2022, it's going to be a unique year in some ways. We've got an election year. We're coming out of COVID. I think the nation is ready to put that in the rearview mirror. Um, but that's going to come with its own set of challenges. What's the Fed going to do? You know, There's a lot of rumors that they're going to push rates maybe four times this year. They're going to ease back on tapering. What is that vacuum of liquidity? What's that going to cause? Uh, do you have any anything that you're watching in particular as we head into 22 on more of a macro sense, Kevin? Uh, yeah, uh, the Fed as well is a concern. Uh, we want to be able to see you know, what they're going to do. And the Fed drives single family homes more than anything else. So you know, in my area specifically, like the homes are being sold for 50,000 over list. And you know, I'd my street is very small. And, you know, it, at this point, my wife and I are like, we should probably just move to Florida because, you know, how can we even leave, you know, 50 grand on the table? And that's, unfortunately, that's going to be the mentality of everything. And then once, you know, the Fed ups or lowers or whatever they decide to do, you know, if they make the debt cheaper, it inflates the, the homes. If you make the debt more expensive, it drives up, you know, the lack of inventory. So really, what can we do to, to subgate? It just doesn't make any sense, you know, and I wish I could say, hey, you know, I could go out and buy some bonds at this particular rate or sell some bonds at this particular rate, but we don't know until the Fed decides to move. So we'll just sit around, we'll wait like everybody else, not make anything too crazy and uh, still continue to reach out to capital investors that want to invest in our funds and just go from there. Um, we know what we can provide. Uh, we won't know what the Fed's going to do. So we'll just sit around and we'll wait for that. Take action accordingly once the details are known. Um, you know, we're entering 2022. What's something that you're hoping to improve in your business this year, Kevin? 
we would like to be able to get into more mid market deals to where there's a lot of value add. I'm on this kick to where I want to be able to take a C prop B or C property and improve it to, you know, B plus, you know, a minus somewhere around there. I'm on a big kick for that. Um, we see a lot of value in that, especially in the Southern States, it seems where everybody's going to be going. So to, to change that over is probably going to be something that we really going to focus on. No, no, there's, uh, it's interesting, the demographic trends, it's either the Rockies or the South Southeastern quadrant of the, the country. Um, I'm curious to see what happens in the Midwest in 2022. I think there's some markets that could do well in those areas. Um, especially as the hunt for yield continues. Um, a lot of these assets in cities like Nashville or Austin or Dallas are just getting bid up tremendously and it's hard to find cash flow. Speaking as a syndicator, um, and so maybe folks will go to places like Little Rock or Kansas City or some of these other places um, looking for a little bit more stability. We'll see. Yeah, absolutely. We, you know, obviously we're looking in those areas, we're looking into the less populated come up areas in Florida. Um, you know, there's, you basically can't drive anywhere in Florida without seeing at least a 15 family somewhere. And it, just because it's not in Tampa does not mean it's not a good deal. It just might take a little while to realize those gains. So, you know, everything's on the table. We're just, like I said, we're going to sit back, you know, continue to service what we have and just watch to see what happens in the first and second quarters. Certainly. Well, Kevin, if folks want to reach out to you, learn more about your lending platform and the products you guys will lend against, where can folks reach you? Uh, it's very simple. Birch, B-I-R-C-H, like the tree, Dobson, D-O-B-S-O-N.com. Thank you for listening to the Real Estate Syndication Show, brought to you by LifeBridge Capital. LifeBridge Capital works with investors nationwide to invest in real estate, while also donating 50% of its profits to assist parents who are committing to adoption. LifeBridge Capital, making a difference, one investor and one child at a time. Connect online at www.lifebridgecapital.com for free material and videos to further your success.